hard to wear a mask and uh, a microphone at the same time, but getting used to it. Adam, are we good with uh, sound? Great. There's a, a fellow named uh, Kerry Newhoff who says it very well. He says, crisis is not just a disruptor, it's an accelerator. And I think he's right. We certainly remain in a time of disruptive crises and patterns of living and ways of doing things that are changing at an accelerating rate. And in the midst of this era, so many people of faith, and as people of faith, we certainly are entitled to grief, sadness, concern, and just missing some of how life used to be. It's more than okay that lots of us are experiencing feelings and thoughts that go along with loss. But I remain convinced that there is a lot of good that can come from what we're going through as a nation and as followers of Jesus. That said, I think it's important, as I suggested last week, that we need to face truths head on and not deny what is happening. And so aside from the headlines of COVID and justified peaceful protests, what are some other things that are happening now in our land? Many of, what, many of the things I'm going to mention are well known by many of us. Over the last few months, clearly telecommuting has become the norm and likely is to remain the case for a long time. Telemedicine has expanded and, in fact, increased access to health care, which is a good thing. Online learning has exploded, exploded, which may drive down education costs, which is also a good thing. What people wear when working has changed in many places, from suits to shorts to wearing far less. <laughs> One survey shows that just 16% of us are living as before the crises that we're facing. Clearly, too many people are out of work and hungry, and Americans have never had worse-looking haircuts in history. <laughs> Although I think Regina did a pretty good job. <laughs> yes, she's dog clippers. It was pretty... <laughs> anyway, here are some specific stats with regard to church. According to Gary Newhoff and others, 40% of people who attend church went online to watch church last week. That's a great number. Over 20% of churchgoers, however, streamed to church other than their home church. And almost 30% of churches have experienced a dramatic increase in attendance over the last few months, albeit online, and this is true for the chapel. Some churches don't have the staff or resources to keep up, and they're declining and dying. This is not good. As one person says, the church as a whole will prevail, but not every church will prevail. So I just want to assure you that we're working very hard here at the chapel to stay ahead of the curve of innovation and in how church is done, and we're investing a lot in the future to meet people where they are in this digitalized world. So thank you all for making it possible, and thank you to our team. Anyway, as we go through this time, the other day I noticed something. I was feeling really tense, and then I noticed my hands. They were all tightened up, and so I opened them, and then I closed them again. And then I opened them up, and then I closed them again. And, and as I it repeated this, I saw to, thought of something. I, I thought that it is, it is so important for me and perhaps for all of us to ask ourselves during this time of great upheaval, what are we open to? What are we closed off to? What do we need to grab a hold of? And so whether you're watching online or you're in church today, I'd like you to hold up one of your hands and I invite you to open up wide like this. And close it again. Open it and close it again. And now, now envision taking a strong hold of something. And so this morning for a few moments I thought that I'd like to explore what might be some things we should be open to. What might we be better off being closed off to? And what do we need to remind ourselves to take a hold of? When we're intentional about these things, it sets us up, I believe, to manage our lives and the future with greater resilience. And to help us get into this whole concept of opening and closing, I'd like to briefly take a look at some stories from Scripture. And specifically, let's first look at some examples of being open and the benefits of being so. Let's, let's frame the following few stories with the words, when good comes from being open. 
Our reading today is about a fellow named Nicodemus, a great story about being open. Because we're told that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and as we know, Pharisees were not the most open-minded folks. They were rigid, stuck, and inflexible, along with arrogant certainty. And these phrases come to mind when I think about the Pharisees as described in Scripture. So when Nicodemus as a Pharisee was around, there was also a ton of upheaval going around in the culture around him. Yet for some reason, Nicodemus got curious. And so he went to Jesus, and he must have been open to at least consider a new way of looking things, or he never would have gone to Jesus to begin with. Certainly not as a Pharisee. He had had to be open. Well, Jesus responds to Nicodemus' curiosity by saying things like, you know, you have to be born again. God's Spirit is like the wind that goes where it chooses. And all of the words, if you look at our reading today to Nicodemus, are about being open. Open to God's movement. Open to God doing something new. Open to seeing God in a new way. Open to a wholesale spiritual change. And while we don't know a lot about the details of Nicodemus' life, he clearly was not only open to a new way of seeing things, but perhaps to seeing God and his own life in a new way. It's a story about being open. And then in Matthew's Gospel, there's a well-known story of the feeding of the 5,000. We know it all, and we know two things. We're more than 5,000 people, for sure, because they only counted men in those days. And we know there was only a pittance of food available. Yet Jesus asked his disciples to feed the people. And they did. Sure, they questioned the whole operation to begin with. What do you mean, Jesus, feed people with this small amount of food? But they did it. And they did what Jesus asked, meaning they were open to consider that the impossible might actually be possible. A great story about being open, as is the story in Mark's Gospel and others of Jesus calling his disciples. It's not like these fellows were sitting around doing nothing. They had jobs and lives and well-established lives at that. Yet they were open to a brand new life, and they followed. Then there's this great story, one more in this category of being open. There's this great story of the woman with a bleeding disorder. And the context is this woman was at a time in which there were no laws to support her, to back her up with any rights. Because she had been ill for so long, She clearly was shunned by the community. Yet she decided in the midst of this to be open to any courage she could discover within herself. She was open to taking on a role in public that she likely would be criticized for. She was open to standing up for herself and what she needed, which was healing. And so despite it all, she's open to going to Jesus despite the consequences, potential consequences from the crowd of doing so. These and other stories about the good that can come from being open, open to, good, to God doing new, thing, new things, open to seeing something differently, open to God's movement, open to impossible things actually happening, open to courage, open to taking an informed risk for something that is good. So are we open to the right things? And while being open can be a very good thing, the opposite can also be true. Being open to something can lead to harm and worse. So let's frame the stories, the following stories with words when bad comes from being open. And there are a lot in Scripture. Jesus asked Judas to be his disciple, to follow him, to learn from him, to love like him, to spread Jesus' life-changing message of forgiveness and healing and hope. But Judas was open to betrayal and being one who betrays. And Judas died because of it. And Jesus was arrested because of Judas' actions and the disciples were terrified. His betrayal had a massive snowball effect. Then there's this story about Peter. Peter is in a tight spot one evening. Jesus had been arrested. It was time for Peter to claim his destiny in public. 
but instead fear overcame him. And like some of us, at least me, fear took over Peter's thinking and he denied knowing Jesus. Peter was open to what fear could do to him. He was open to denying truth. And then in this category, finally, there's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. The Christian community at the time, the believers, it's amazing, but they would, they would share what they had and no one claimed ownership of anything. That's how the first Christians were together. Everything was held in common. Nobody was needy. People sold what they had and turned it over to the community. But when a fellow named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold their property, they held back and they lied to the community about much, how much money they had. They were open to lying. They were open to deceit. They were open to not being truthful. This caused quite the stir in the community, and they both died. The point of these stories is sometimes when we're open to something, we are not served well. Being open can lead to harm and hurt and snowball in ways we do not anticipate. And so we need to be very careful with what we're open to. But in addition to the possibility of being open and good or bad coming from it, There's also kind of a flip question, which is not being open to something and looking at the good and the bad that can come from that. Here are some examples of not being open in which the results were really good. Let's frame the following stories with the words when good comes from not being open. One day Jesus was praying with his disciples, and while we don't know what they were praying about, Jesus interrupted the prayer session with some questions. He said, Hey, uh, my followers, who do the crowd say that I am? And people at the time had all kinds of opinions and feelings about Jesus. And his disciples shared the range of reactions they had been hearing from the public. And Jesus then asked, but who do you say that I am? And I think this story in part might be not only about checking to see if his followers understood who Jesus was, but in fact to explore if his followers would be swayed by the court of public opinion. Peter answers Jesus by telling Jesus he knows that he is the Messiah. Peter calls it like it is, and he knows it by answering the question this way, that he is not going to be in alignment with what a lot of people were thinking about Jesus in that time. You might say that Peter was not open to allowing popular views to sway what he knew in his heart. And this was a very good thing because Peter was foundational to the whole Jesus movement. Then in the Gospel of Luke, there's a story of the blind beggar. The poor fellow is sitting by a road when a crowd of people goes by, and when he hears the noise of the people, he begins calling out, Jesus. And the crowd tells the beggar to stop it. But Jesus hears the man, and he goes to him. And the crowd then watches as Jesus heals the beggar and his sight is restored. The crowd then, which previously had told the beggar to knock it off, suddenly started praising God for what Jesus had done in a quick turn of events. Now in this story, the beggar was not open to remaining in a helpless state. No more helplessness for me. He shut the door on being stuck in a bad place. And he reached out to Jesus and his life changed. And these and other stories illustrate that when we close ourselves off to things or are not open to something, it can be the right thing to do. And finally, let's take a brief look at stories that illustrate the opposite of the ones I just shared. When bad comes from not being open. In Matthew's Gospel is a story of when Jesus goes to his hometown. People in the town knew Jesus. They knew his parents. He'd grown up there, and one day while Jesus is at home, he begins to teach. But the people were offended by Jesus. They rejected Jesus. They were not open to what he has to say. They discounted him. Why? Because he's the hometown guy. We know this guy. We know what he was like when he was a kid. 
And they end up, we're told, not believing who Jesus is or anything he has to say. And because they were not open, they missed out on the invitation to a new life. And then in Mark's gospel, one day Jesus is out on the road. He encounters a man. The man wants to know how to be sure that eternal life is ahead for him. Jesus reminds him of the Ten Commandments. And the man says, I've kept them all. And then Jesus, we're told, looks with love at the man and says, you lack one thing. Go sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and come and follow me. This is not a story about the need for all of us to sell everything. It is, however, a story about a man who was not willing to let go of the one thing getting in the way of having a life that God intended for him. He was not open to what Jesus was trying to say to him. And he walked away in a sad state, we're told. And the last story this morning is in Luke's Gospel about some religious folks. They're worshiping on the Sabbath day in the synagogue. Jesus goes into the synagogue. All the religious stuff is going on. The man has a withered hand. And Jesus asked the man to stretch out his hand. And when he did so, he was healed. And the people at the worship service were furious. And they began to jabber about Jesus. These folks were not open to matters of the heart. Their focus was on the rules, what's written down, what's tradition, what are the regulations, what are the expectations. And because their hearts were not open, because their minds were not open, they lost touch not only with Jesus, but with love itself. I want us all to really be thinking about these things. When good comes from being open, When bad comes from being open. When good comes from not being open. When bad comes from not being open. This is such important stuff for us to think about, especially when so much is uncertain around us. And I believe that God invites us to explore these questions and these issues honestly and directly and intentionally in discussion with others that matter to us and in a state of a lot of prayer. This sermon is really a homework sermon for all of us to be intentional. Life is so different now in many ways. Foundations have been shaken, so have ways of looking at things. But I'm clear we each need to get crystal clear on what we're open to and what we're not. We will stay grounded as a result. We will thrive in the midst of change. We'll avoid a lot of heartache and we'll discover solid ground underneath us. And then lastly this morning, what are we hold on to at this time? I've looked at the stories of people of great faith in times of astonishing crises over the generations. And it's very clear to me that people of Christian faith, the one thing that they held on to more than anything else was Jesus. They kept Jesus front and center in their mind and in their thoughts and in their actions. And if you look at the stories of people who have great faith, who have been resilient during times of great challenge and held on to Jesus, they they held on to Jesus, not just in their minds, but they held on to Jesus by how they acted out in the world. They acted with love and integrity when everybody around them was not. They acted with honesty and humility when surrounded by distortions of truth and arrogance. They they acted with compassion and kindness when they were surrounded by meanness. They forgave. They expressed empathy. And they were selfless and hopeful when everything around them was the opposite. They held on to Jesus by praying and acting upon Jesus in their lives. And I think part of the way that we hold on to Jesus, of course, is to know his story. And we know his story through the Gospels. And we need to go over his story over and over and over and over again. And when we get to know Jesus' story, we become more sensitive to the sound of Jesus' voice. And in this era of competing voices, 
God invites us to listen to the voice of Jesus far, 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 far above all others. God invites us to be silent far more than when we open our mouths because it's in that silence that we hear the voice of God. What are we open to? What are we not open to? Keep our eyes squarely on Jesus. Just some things to think and pray about in this topsy-turvy time that I know will make a difference in your life and in mine. And let us pray.